First of all, Jason Ferris, welcome to Whitstable. Nice Thank to see you, you here. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Um, first thing I'd like to ask you about, because um, the day job isn't actually gigging around. The day job is actually making the instruments that you gig with. Yeah. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you got into banjo making? Sure. I was, uh, I was a banjo player first. I started when I was about uh, 19 or 20. And my obsession with the banjo started shortly after that. And... Um, I found myself in Arcata, California, went to school for fun, woodworking and cabinet making. There was a well-established banjo maker uh, living and working there and had been since the 70s. That's Wildwood Banjos. And so everything just kind of came together in the right way. My obsession with banjos and learning how to work with wood um, and then uh, working with him and a few other guitar makers to kind of round yeah. off my experience and uh, fulfill some interests. Um, and so it just really kind of happened organically. Um, I was borrowing little bits of business models from the various makers I'd worked for. You know, I didn't really want to just sell the stores because I didn't want to make models, which is, you know, making the same exact thing. So that, yeah. uh, um, so anyways, I just, we just found our way into um, a really nice business model early on. There's such a large family of banjos. Do really so you specialize in a particular form of banjo? You know... I think that we would actually specialize in the whole family, which makes us a lot different than a lot, most right. other banjo makers because we are embracing the entire banjo family. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of folks are either specifically open back, old time, or bluegrasses are kind of the two schools. And so even though that's definitely most of the banjos we make are going to be open back for um, old time style playing. I'm really trying to push the banjo ukuleles, the banjo mandolins, banjo guitars, the mm -hmm. gourd banjos, various kinds of tenor banjos. Um, and I do make bluegrass banjos, although um, I don't specialize in that. So I'm trying to, you know, the early banjo companies, um, early being, you know, 1870s to uh, 1920s, they really kind of tried to build the whole family as yeah. well. So yeah. I'm, again, taking um, inspiration from, yeah. from those early makers. As a, someone who knows nothing about the instrument, apart from the fact that you sort of like play it with your fingers, um, one thing that always m I wonder about is the fifth string and yeah. why the tuning key for that is sort of like halfway down the, the neck of the banjo. Uh, what's the history of that and uh, how does that position come about? Um, well, these days I think it's pretty um, well known that that would have been a drone string that's directly brought over from Africa um, mm -hmm. via the West Indies and then uh, through the slave trade. And so that was a drone string. So that string is normally tuned to, to what the instrument is tuned to, so it's constantly droning whatever that note is. Well, have mentioned the instruments that you play but haven't talked yet about uh, your music itself. Um, how did you come to team up as a, as a duo? You want to take one? Oh, sure, yeah. Um, we had actually been uh, match made by a fellow musician who is a, a great uh, dobro player, Ivan Rosenberg, and he had talked each of us up to each other for about a year before we met. Right. And Jason came, he was coming to British Columbia on a fly fishing trip and took about a thousand mile detour to come and meet me while I was living on Vancouver Island. I didn't know that's <laughs> what he was doing. And we really hit it off. We got married about two and a half months later. We met at an old-time fiddle jam in Victoria, so both played, you know, fiddle music, uh, guitar, banjo, all those kind of things, but mostly instrumental stuff, and we really bonded over that early country string band, hillbilly kind of music yeah, yeah. from the southeastern Appalachian regions of the States in particular, but uh, across musical traditions from across North America, we, I think. Yeah. We're both in love with that. Both in love with that, that old That thing yeah. that, that happens um, that in indelible, music. indelible groove where no one, I shouldn't say no one, some people are Im imitating each other, but there's a lot more individual movement in the music where you can really hear the regional distinctions. And, you know, some, some of this, these old recordings, you're hearing stuff and the scratches from the 78 are louder than the actual music itself, yeah. and yeah. You're, you're having to do some very intense takes listening. takes a while yes, yeah. the years to listen to it. Yeah, yeah. but we both knew... We both knew we loved that music, and so that was a real that was a real point of um, commonality for yeah. us. And from there, we just Jason moved up to BC, and we started singing more together after we got married. Yeah, we and didn't really yeah. push it when it we was, got together. We knew I, th I think we both knew it was just going to happen organically. We were, yeah, as far as yeah. like we met, we yeah. sing okay together. Let's let's try to do something. It yeah. was never like that. It was always. I mean, you probably know like with bluegrass and old time, most people who 
listen to that music also play that kind of music yes yeah it's yeah. I, maybe Irish music is like that same way it's something about the style that so I think we were both just always have been players yeah just because that's what we yeah. do so the whole logistics of, of touring though I mean you're over in BC mm-hmm. getting say over to the other side of your country Quebec is probably the same as flying from Quebec over over to here yeah. it it's is. such a vast it country is. it's a huge country yeah, yeah. I mean how, does it does it take really careful planning financially as well as time-wise to work out where you can, can you play? You know, we, um, we're lucky in that because we are a duet, we are, we're fairly, you know, we're not paying a five-piece band. Yeah, and we're married. Like, so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, All yeah. the money goes into one bank account. Yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> it's yeah. like, it, in a yeah. way, it is the, probably the most profitable yeah. uh, option for yeah. musicians. So... I mean, we have a lot of friends who are working musicians, and I respect the hell out of them because it is not an easy life. Mm. So uh, the fact that we can stand back and pick and choose a little bit, I am eternally grateful for, especially for the patience of the people on my banjo wait list because (laughs) for every day that we are not in the shop, the wait for a banjo waits the exact amount of time. So, yeah, we kind of have our eye on the end of the summer as a way to... As the pullback, I think, and just do banjos. Just finally, I must ask you: um, Have you ever made a banjo and thought, "I really, really don't want to give this one away"? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, yes, I've made instruments. I don't know what it was. You know, they just have an extra five percent sparkle to them. Yeah. I, you know, I don't remember which ones they were, but when I'll string one up and. I'm just like, you know, it's probably what I expected and hoped it to sound like, but then there's a little bit more. Yeah. That's kind of, that definitely happens. Yeah. But I've never, I've never felt like, oh, I've got to call the guy and try to figure out how to not sell it to him. Because so, <laughs> I'll just, you know, I'll just make another one. Well, yeah. long may you continue to make a good living out of it. It's lovely to see you here in Bristol. Thank and, uh, you so much for the time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.